lots to discuss. So I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Myra Keyes um, from British Columbia Cancer Agency. She really needs no introduction. I mean, she has been an absolute superstar in our field. She's been very generous with her time. She's just a lovely person. In fact, three or four years ago, she doesn't want me to say this, but they were trying to figure out who's going to be the next president. And I'm like, Myra, you should be the next president. So she graciously decided I should do this, which is fine, and I'm happy to do it. But uh, Myra, your talk on physician burnout is very timely. I hope a lot of you can stay for this because it's really something that we all struggle with. We're in a high demand specialty. We talk a lot about the curative aspects of brachytherapy, but the truth is, if you're treating other disease sites, we're in a tough field. So, Dr. Keyes, welcome, and we are really looking forward to your talk. Well, I just knew Dan is going to be a fantastic president, so here he is. Thanks so much, Dan. I really applaud for your initiatives. You've done an absolutely great job. So um, I have a guest for my talk, and this is uh, Brian Moran. So Brian, do you want to come and have a seat? So Brian wanted to kind of chit-chat with me throughout this talk, and I think we have like, what, 40, 45 minutes, something like that, so we'll just go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so where does this interest, I've been um, like a clinician, academic, and you know, I've been involved in my field, and then I kind of sidetrack into physician burnout. And so, how did that happen? So, uh, yeah, you guessed it. I completely find myself actually completely burnt out. And then I wondered, like, okay, why has this happened to me? And how can we kind of really work together so it happens to less people? And, and first of all, how big is the problem, and what is it? So. Burnout is an erosion of the soul caused by deterioration of one's value, dignity, spirit, and will. And that really means when working harder is actually not working. So who can relate to that? Only a few of you? Yeah, okay, I, I can. <laughs> and so I love, do you like Dr. Seuss? I love Dr. Seuss, and I, this is my favorite probably saying from Dr. Seuss. Be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter and those, those who matter don't mind. So this is gonna be kind of an underlying in this presentation. So the objectives are really to learn out what's actually burnout, to diagnose yourself and maybe your colleagues and ask yourself a question, am I burned out? And so some of you may be surprised with an answer and to see what is the treatment and what can you actually do about this. So this is the consequence of a burnout, medical errors. This all has been, by the way, documented, malpractice, risk, quality care, suffers, self, staff turnover. People are actually leaving medicine earlier, so that's gonna be a huge problem as millennials are kind of moving in. A lot of baby boomers are actually moving out in greater numbers than millennials can actually replace us. And then there's a silver tsunami. Have you heard of that silver tsunami? This is really baby boomers getting older and kind of needing medical care. So disruptive behavior, resistance to change, physicians, disengagement, divorce, substance, substance abuse, uh, depression and suicide and early retirement. So these are all consequences of physician burnout. And I think in Canada I have you know, taken some initiative to talk to uh, Canadian Medical Association and suggest that this should be really an accreditation issue. You know, they come to our institution and they want us to kind of see what kind of sinks do we have in the OR, but the fact that, you know, 50% of the staff is burned out, that actually doesn't matter. But as long as the sinks are working <clears throat> and they're properly positioned, that's really what matters. So it makes no sense. So this is really what people find more challenging in the job in the U.S. This is a U.S. survey just recently kind of published. A lot of people find that uh, there's really these regulations and, you know, interaction with, with you and in insurance agency that it's kind of killing you, right? And then also electronic medical records are a big problem everywhere, I would say. I can't do this with glasses and I can do it without glasses. It's a real problem. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm kind of undecided now whether to keep the glasses on or on. But the other huge issue is really physician suicide. And I don't know if you know, but approximately one entire class of medical school actually disappears every year in the U.S. based, you know, on this problem, physician suicide. And it's quite substantial. So if you look at this is 2020 report, National Medscape Physician Burnout and Suicide, 
one to two percent of all physicians who were uh, in interviewed or did a survey actually attempted suicide, and 24 percent thought about this, and also a lot would prefer not to actually answer that question. In oncology, 40 percent of the oncologists are actually burnt out. So if you just turn to your neighbor and just tell them, like, you're burnt out, you know, the chances is that you're actually right. So uh, about one-third of uh, oncology or, you know, population have really no issues with burnout, and one-third has really moderate issue, and, you know, one-third to one-half actually have severe issue with burnout. Um, so depression is really very common amongst uh, physicians. It's actually quite high. Um, and there are some programs that hospitals are kind of trying to introduce, but they're kind of not working because people don't want to participate in the programs and it's very stigmatized and, and whatnot. So it's, it's, it's actually a huge problem. Canadian Medical Association actually had a huge survey that was just recently published. 32% of Canadian physicians are actually burned out, and I thought those who are actually burned out didn't really even bother to actually do the questionnaire, right? And um, there is 20% had lifetime suicidal ideation, 20%, and 9% in the last 12 months. Okay. Most susceptibles are actually young physicians and females. So there's some of you in the room here, so should kind of think about this. And this is a 2018 uh, U.S. Um, 15,000 physician survey. Burnout in women is 48%, in men 38%, 11% were, were depressed, 4% clinically depressed. People complain about bureaucratic tasks and long working hours, DMRs, and lack of respect from administration. And there is this initiative from National Academy of Medicine to try to reverse actually these trends in clinicians' burnout. So we looked at burnout in my institution in 2012 that was kind of presented at ASCO, only published in, in abstract. And despite of me telling you that I can go and you know, have coffee in Starbucks if I don't do an implant, I actually rarely do that because I'm way too busy. And so 60% of oncologists in BC are actually burnt out. 67% considered reducing their FTEs, and uh, 40, half of us consider actually leaving BC to look for greener pastures. And so these are some other statistics. So this is the logo that I came out, sort of BC cancer. By the way, that's like a we break cancer. We don't understand this new logo. It's just we, we kind of hate it. But so then I kind of put it, BC is actually burnt out. So oncology burnout, so this, the numbers are really the same. 66% <clears throat> of us really are not satisfied with work-life balance. That's a, that's a large number. And 28% plan to retire before age <clears throat> 65. So we all want to reduce the clinical hours, and we want to leave the present condition. And so the picture is not pretty. But then millennials are coming in, so they're a little bit different breed. So they seem like they're not going to really kind of be putting up with this. But what I found is, is actually from Medscape. I like to read that. And so uh, they're really annoyed with, are you annoyed with this um, title of provider? Like I really get annoyed with that. I think I'm a physician, I'm not provider. And so, and also this replacement of physicians with kind of cheap labor and cheaper for the healthcare system. And uh, also the healthcare system seems to be kind of blaming uh, cost on physicians. And physicians are feeling really kind of disappointed and angry and, and kind of the, things are not really working really well for us. But it seems like millennials are not going to be putting up with that. And they really have a lot of comfort in actually advocating for themselves, like questioning the status quo. So I have a lot of... A lot of um, a lot of faith in millennials. So one of my daughters actually just finished um, medical school interview, and so I'm not sure if I'm happy for her to be in medical school or not, but part of this work is really just to make, if she gets to medical school, and she seems to love it, so to actually really have a better environment for her and for all of our kids and for all of our young doctors. So these are the signs of burnout, exhaustion, dep depersonalization, and lack of efficiency. And there's a quote here, I'm not sure how much longer can I go on like this. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Who has? Yeah, Brian, did you want to comment on that? Well, I'll, I'll let you direct your questions to me, but I'll be very honest to all of you. I'm, I've got every one of these things. And a year ago, probably a year and a half ago, I was very robust in my practice and seeing 
tons of patience and teaching and it just, I, I, it's me. I mean, I met Mira and we were in Denver in November doing a course and I just bumped into her and she's like, how are you? And I said, I'm terrible. Um, you know, the, I had to sell my practice because I lost my referral base and I had a lot of personal things going. I lost a little nine-year-old nephew, a lot of family issues, and it just all happened at once. And before I knew it, I found myself having every one of these things. So I reached out to Mira, and so she's helping me. I still love to be in the operating room. I still love to see patients. But, I mean, if, if it can happen to me, I mean, it can happen to anybody. Because I was just, I'm, I've been so carefree and jolly the whole time, and yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, I would never hurt myself. I'll go, I'll go, <laughs> I'll go cut yeah. bait. I'll never yeah. do that. Yeah. But I'll sign on a fishing boat or something before I do that. But I'm, yeah, I've had it. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just trying to hang in there. Probably the only thing that's keeping me going is, is the teaching, you yeah. know, the residents and the fellows. I, you know, I, but I probably will leave my current position and go to one of the universities on a part-time basis. I've already scaled back. That's my first step. Mira advised me, she goes, just, I, I could never say no to anybody for whatever reason. And so I now have an exercise where I just say no, I, I, I can't help you unless I really want to, but I just don't sign on to things. And I've decompressed my clinical schedule to about 60%, which has helped. So some of us actually are really afraid that we're going to start making mistakes if this keeps on going like this. So that's another really, um, you know, huge issue. So how does this all happen? So it does happen because we do have excessive job demands and we do get exhausted. And in, particularly in Canada, I would say, we have lack of resources and we become quite cynical about the whole thing. That has been quite well researched. But so here's the physics, physical exhaustion is one domain and the other one is cynicism. And I love this coffee mug. I'm trying to be awesome today, but I'm exhausted from being freaking awesome yesterday. So we have to be freaking awesome every single day at our work, right? And then we become really impersonal. There's this compassion fatigue, and we become really cynical and, and sarcastic. And so, and we do see that there's no purpose to, to our work. Like, we don't see the value in it, and there's lack of meaning and pride. But, you know, males are typical. They're, like, they become very critical and disruptive. And they keep on telling themselves, well, I'm doing a great job. Like, man, I'm so good. So, Brian, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so oh, we talked about it yesterday. So I'm, I'm just so good as I know you are. I know you are. That's a, that's a really a red flag, right? And the females, <laughs> the females, we tend to kind of confine in other, you know, colleagues and seek help. So we're just kind of a little bit different. So we kind of tend to talk about it. And so what's the difference between stress and burnout? I think this is one of the key slides to really understand that you're actually not able to recover if you're burnt out. You just can't recover. And energy is really in the la um, uh, downward spiral, and energy is kind of leaking. It's like a sinking boat. There is a hole, and you just can't get this water fast enough, and you know water is coming in. And any sabbaticals or any kind of, you know, vacations are just not enough. You come back to work, and it's just kind of in the same mess. You know, when you left like two two weeks ago or two months ago, and you just can't cope. I mean, this is so. This is, this is a huge difference. When you're just stressed, like you know, stress is over, or you have a vacation, you're kind of better, and your energy recuperates, and you're refreshed, and you're you know full of enthusiasm. With burnout, you just don't ever get there, and so that's how the burnout actually looks like. And so there is this physical, emotional, and spiritual tank that we have, and almost imagine it like a bank account, right? And so, and we, in, in time, this keeps on getting emptier and emptier, and then you go into red, and then the bank is kind of screaming at you, and really in time, you just burn out, and you just can't really repay that debt. So something completely needs to actually shift, otherwise you end up like these residents, you know, who are in the harnesses to keep them awake during the surgery. You know, when I was uh, coming here, my flight was supposed to be from Vancouver and Se to Seattle at quarter to eight, and I was at the airport at six o'clock. I got up at like 4.30, you know, and so here I am all in half six o'clock, and they tell me, well, your flight is actually delayed until 9.30, and I was like, oh, God, you know, it's six o'clock, 9.30, so then my, you know, flight to here was delayed, and it's like, oh, the mess, right? So I was just feeling so, so kind of like demoralized, and I said, well, why is the flight delayed? I didn't, you know, that last night, you know, when I kind of checked in I said, oh, sorry about that, like, you know, um, like pilots actually needed to sleep. 
And I thought, wow, pilots needed to sleep. And she said, well, you, d you wouldn't want pilots, a tired, a tired pilot to actually fly to your plane, would you? And I'm thinking, no, I really wouldn't. I'm glad I did actually have an extra sleep. And I thought, has anybody ever asked you, actually, if you had enough sleep? <laughs> anybody before you go to the OR, ever? And I thought, wow, pilots have enough sleep. So why does it all happen? It's because our practices are very complicated and we're dealing with dying people and sick people and this is all really actually quite hard. When I sometimes step back you know, from what I do and I'm thinking, my God, this is really very intense, a very actually hard job to do. We, we don't think about it. And then job itself, there is these horrendous workloads and regulations and you know, all of that that comes with a job and you have an extra layer of bureaucracy in the States, which we don't have in Canada. And then there is personal life and, and this work-life balance with, with your partners and marriages and family and kids and you know, aging parents. And, and then there's this job which is like an 800 pound gorilla that sits in your house and you can't ignore it because it's actually always there. You can't shut it in the other door because it just comes out and wants you, right? So it always wants you. So, and then really there is your organization. So, oh, good job, he's dead, right? So that's sometimes how it feels, right? They, they, I don't know if you have a feeling, but I have feelings sometimes that they don't really care about me. They, I mean, do they care about me? They don't. Um, so there is really kind of becoming this um, erosion of trust, really, between us and organizations, poor leadership, maybe, maybe you don't have a boss or have a bad boss, and there's this new policies and new people and, you know, uh, sometimes very high staff turnover, which is very stressful for everybody. This could be a very stressful organization and change for the sake of change. Do you have these administrators who just have to justify their job, like, so they're just going to, you know, just impose something on you so then they can justify why they're paid so much? It's incredible. So here's the natural history. How do we actually get there? So we really trained, uh, uh, we get trained in medical schools. And so this is what we get trained. This is like a hidden curriculum. So uh, we train to be workaholics because solution is just to work harder. We get trained to be lone rangers and kind of suck it up. Do you know that? Like suck it up. Um, so we also get trained to be these superheroes and perfectionists. Everything has to be done perfect. And, uh, you know, agonized over irrelevant details if necessary, always. And we also have to be emotion free. We should have no feelings for ourselves, for patients, for our colleagues. Uh, we, you know, they teach you how to be guilty if you're not kind of up to these standards. And so we develop these skills. Brian, is this correct? Yeah, I mean, everything you're saying is me. And so there is really an interesting systemic review and meta-analysis about medical schools around the world. So this is not only the United States, this is really on four, like five continents. And so 195 studies, like uh, loads of medical students in 47 countries. And look at the depression rate is average 30% depression rate in medical schools. This is really scary. This is really scary. And depression is between 9 and 55%. And 11% are suicidal and that ranges between 7 to 24%. So there's also studies to show that most healthy uh, young people actually go to a medical school. And this is what we train them to become. This is a hidden curriculum. And so, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about a burnout and what is the first law of burnout. And please remember this. You can't give what you don't have yourself. And so we tend to really extend ourselves and uh, we tend to give endlessly because somehow we think we can and that's absolutely not true. And this mantra, the patient comes first. Have you heard that before? Patient always, always comes first. That's the mantra, right? And so the professions that where customers always come first have the highest rate of burnout, which is hospitality, which is healthcare, military, and police. The highest burnout rates. Um, and of course, never show the weakness and never ask for help and never tell anybody, like, you know, it's really hard for me. Like, you know, I, I have some problems. Maybe we can go for a coffee and talk about this or, you know, ask professional help. We don't do that because we don't even recognize that we actually need some help. 
And then the New York Times lately, I love this uh, article. It says the medical systems are counting on nurses and doctors to suck it up because you know they want to walk away from their patients. It's not just bad strategy, it's a bad medicine. Who can relate to this? They know that you're gonna be there. They absolutely know, and they count on it, actually. And so um, they keep on endlessly, you know, as the administrators, giving you another task and another task because that makes them look better, and they have their jobs justified. But look at this now. The healthcare system needs to be restructured to reflect the realities of patient care. From 1975 to 2010, the number of healthcare administrators increased 3,200%. There is now roughly 10 administrators for every doctor. Hmm. That's the US numbers. I mean, this is crazy. I don't think we have that in Canada. Do we have Gerard? But we are maybe like five and like this is, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. And healthcare is really about taking care of patients, not paperwork. We kind of forgot that, right? So uh, burnout becomes a chronic condition with very disruptive behavior and complications can be actually quite severe, and many quit, leave medicine, or retire. And if you recognize you can actually change, you, you can change, and you can change relationship with yourself and relationship with career, and you can recover, and you should actually use the burnout for this highest purpose, to return to joyful practice in medicine. And I love this Turkish, Turkish proverb that says, no matter how far you have gone on the wrong road, turn back, turn back. And lifetime incidence of burnout is 100%. So all of you sitting here who haven't burnt out, you will, let me tell you that, you will. And actually every physician who is of my age and maybe I was Brian or somebody else, uh, you actually have a few episodes of these burnout episodes. I certainly can count like three or four and I'm going through my fifth one right now. So, and, and I always kind of, and I told my secretary, Catherine, I said, Catherine, can you please, please just remind me to say no? And she just looked at me, it's like, okay, Mira, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I said, can, can you just really, like, remind me because I forget. And I forget because everything that I do is, I love it and it's interesting, but uh, um, anyway, prevalence of um, burnout is 60%. So what's the opposite of burnout? It's really engagement. So where we have a control over our workload, where we have a control over our environment, so we have to have the sense of control. We think we are rewarded properly. There is a community and social support networks. And I find that what really saves you know, our bots in Vancouver, we actually really have a wonderful department, so we are all very collegial. There's 22 radiation oncologists. And uh, you know, we kind of keep each other as well. This is really the truth. I don't know what I would have done without my colleagues. So I always kind of count on, if I'm really super stressed, you know, there is Karen's door next door, and so here I am in Karen's office. And it's like, ah! you know, Karen, this is what happened. And likewise, you know, a lot of people do this. Like, we just do it all the time, and, and somehow just uh, release that, that um, pressure that we have. We have to feel the sense of fairness in our, in our organization. And we have to know that we are actually valued. So this is when we get back to the system and we engage. So physician burnout is now being recognized by many different organizations. This is our um, BC Medical Association, or we call ourselves Doctors of BC. And so they have now a huge campaign looking as to what are the you know, signs of burnout, like why we burn out. And paperwork and EMR, number one. Number two, high pressure to make money, to pay the staff, to pay the offices, right? Increasing rules and regulations. They're really not uh, done with physicians' inputs. And again, these administrators justifying their positions. And then there's also unrealistic expectations of patients and administrators you know, press upon the doctors and system-wide uh, resource constraints, which we're well aware as, as Canadians. And the solutions they felt are really reduced administrative burden, better compensation, so pay your doctors more, and also get doctors engaged actually in, um, in decision-making process in healthcare and prioritize physicians' health. So we'll see how that works. But you're all probably aware of these triple aim organizations that really the goal of our organizations is to enhance the patient experience. 
improve the population health and reduce the cost. That's what they're all about. So in, in, in Canada, they reduce the cost so they can save money for the government. With you, they reduce the cost so they can keep your money in the organization. So it's a profit, right? But really, there is now this quadruple organization coming in, which is to uh, also look at a high-quality patient care that is actually rooted in the health and well-being of, again, providers. Providers. I hate that word. Providers. Mm -hmm. Providers. Okay. So what are the options now? What can you do for yourself? So with great power, as you know, comes great responsibility. But I like this one even better. With great responsibility comes the great power. And we all have that. So work-life balance and this whole issue is really not a problem. It's actually a dilemma because the problems have solution. This is a dilemma and dilemma does not have a solution. You can't solve the dilemmas, but you have to have strategy how to work with them. And the first one is really awareness of your time and energy that you have and begin to really conscientiously uh, be aware where you're spending your time and your energy and how you're spending your time and energy and what are you get, actually getting back in return. And I always tell people, find something outside of the medicine that you build into your life every week and every month and every year, so you actually really look forward to it, and you schedule actually that in advance, so you know you're coming to Big Sky, you know you're going to Hawaii, and this is actually in your calendar, it's not gonna happen unless you actually put that in. So it's a balancing act to actually maintain that health uh, and, and awareness and, and the balance between your work and your, and your, and your um, private life. But, so here are some more kind of helpful tips to recognize your programming, to recognize that you are workaholics. So I, I, I am. Brian, are you a workaholic? I used to be. Oh, I love this answer. I used to be. I still yeah, am. Yeah, I, I really was. <laughs> I worked 60, yeah. 70 hours a week for 30 years. And then, you know, when all this happened to me, I, unlike you say the most males, I'm more like a female. I came right out and said, something's wrong. I knew something was wrong. And, um, you know, I just admitted it to everybody. I, I got a scribe. Um, she handles my EMR stress. I, you know, but the, the staff turnover, I, my whole team has been with me 20 some years and they, the new owners just said, you don't need these people. And so, just a lot of loss. So I'm just stepping back and trying to do all the things you're recommending. But I will try to re-engage. Yeah. That's my next step. I mean, step. It, it takes time. It takes time to actually withdraw yourself out of the system and then kind of get back in and think yeah, it's, about it's how hard. am I going to get back in. But it's, it's uh, very real. I mean, what you said about 100%, I mean, like I said, I never thought this would happen to me. Yeah, yeah. It, it's we, like, we all do, yeah. yeah. getting hit by a car without, you know, you look both ways and you still get hit by the car. So, so we recognize that this is how we have been trained to be at our work and this is normalized and this is how everybody should be, right? This is what is expected from you, just kind of be aware of that. And that we don't ask for help until we are absolutely collapse and you know, we don't have any emotions and we are always superheroes for everybody and all of that, right? Um, and then, you know, have a strategy how to go home on time. This is where I started. Um, I used to do head and neck and, um, and GU and so I, I would find myself 7, 7.30, I'm still contouring these nasal pharynxes and Jesus Christ, I mean, you know, 8 o'clock, finally I'm home and that just keeps on going. And, uh, and then it dawned on me like, no, oh, actually I am going to go home at 5. So that was the decision. So that was my first thing that I said, I'm going to go home at 5. I had no idea how is that going to happen. But eventually I actually, you know, gave up head and neck and went on to do breast, which I actually quite enjoy now after a little bit of a break. Um, and I now go home at five o'clock. I also became very efficient in this EMR and I went to people who actually were really good at it and I said, well, what are your shortcuts? What do you do? So now I enjoy EMR instead of hating it. So that was one thing that I learned. It's like I was a, such a hater of this, you know, computers in EMR. So then I said, if I'm a hater of this, like, ugh, it's gonna hate me back, right? So that didn't work. So, and this is how the whole, whole thing unraveled for me. Um, I also created a lot of this batch processing kind of, you know, um, uh, concept is, is actually really good. So just look at your email maybe twice a day, not 
don't do it all the time. Um, stop multitasking. And I also created a lot of like patient handouts that we, when we give to the patients, which I found extremely good because they don't phone us, you know, back as much because everything is written down, you know, for them. And then think about your um, bucket list and my death bet, I regret not doing what? And then start doing your bucket list. And one of my bucket lists was to, I wanted to paint. And then I thought like, well, I'll paint when I retire. And then I thought like, wow, that's a long time until I retire. Why don't I paint now? So I started to paint and do many other things, which really actually gave, gave me joy. Um, and so I would highly recommend you find something that, that you really like to do and do it now. Don't wait until retire. And again, plan your week with these meaningful events and activities and actually put it in your calendar, put it on your phone and you know when is it coming. If you have a family calendar, put it in your family calendar so everybody knows what's, what's going on. Um, and so, but you know, may just add like just one item. I'm sure you're all busy, but just start with one, one. And you'll see how much actually joy you have just looking forward to that coming next week. You'll see that it's actually quite, quite great. The other useful habits would be to have this boundary ritual. So when I told you I um, started to go home at five o'clock, so it took a little bit of a while for me to adjust how I work and, and then to really go home at five o'clock. But then I added another thing, it was five o'clock, and I, and I leave my office kind of really like bang the door. <laughs> People was like, why are you banging the door? So for me, that door bang was really like, okay, I am now a completely different life. So I leave everything in the office and now like my, my life really begins and that door bang was really my kind of a alarm system for my brain. Now we're completely switching the gears and I really actually like that. So that was my boundary ritual. And really schedule your time with other people, people that you love, people that you care about. Um, date your partners, your kids, date yourself, take yourself out for a date. And, um, pay for vaca vacation in advance and actually put in your calendar. So if, if it's paid already, like you're going to go, you're not gonna be tempted to cancel it last second because you really have like five different implants coming and nobody else can do it, just you, right? Um, and really nurture your interest outside of the work, the work. So how can we change? If you actually want to change your practice or your life and um, have a new awareness, it is really mandatory that you take a different action. So you have to do something different. You have to take a different action. So this is Robert before and Robert after. In only two weeks, Robert lost his glasses, right? So Robert lost his glasses. So for different results, you must take different actions. Is that, is that right, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll add that there was probably a delay once I recognized there was a problem. It, it, it took me a while to say, okay, there, there's really a problem here, you know, to take action and to reach out and make some changes. But it's insidious as hell, you know, what happened to me. And I didn't even do anything wrong. Yep. You know? I think that, that's the thing. We really don't notice it. And even sometimes other people will notice and we're kind of like, what? Uh, so... Um it's very insidious. It's but I, very, very as, insidious. As a part of it, I've done a lot of those things. Like every Monday night, I may have dinner with a certain group of fellows. Um, I spend a lot of time with my grandkids every minute I can. So, it, you know, it's taking action. Yeah, it is really taking the action. But now you will really want to kind of change many things that you go home, maybe. And maybe it's like, oh, I can do this, this, and this, and this. But I would just say don't. Don't really because achieving big goals is accomplished by making very small and measurable steps that lead to improvement. And this is a Kaizen principle. If you haven't read about Kaizen principle, it's actually really fun to read and it, it's actually very, very true. And you have to really also create a vision of how you want your life to be and ask small questions and yeah. think small thoughts and take small actions and identify small, identify actually small moments in your life where you really feel this is worth living. This is what I actually enjoy. It, it does take a different mindset, different sets of skills. And once you kind of start getting hang out of it, it really, really works. 
So implement really one tool at a time and change one small thing at a time. And for me, it was a decision to leave at five o'clock. And that second decision was to bang the door. So everybody knows when I hear the bang in the department, oh, Mira is going home. So everybody knows that, yeah. So bang the door and leave home. It's like that's where everything actually started. And as you know, the journey of 1,000 miles begins with a single step. So these are some of my personal thoughts. We have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> so we talk about organizations and how they need to be different and mean administrators and whatnot. But really, like the, the bottom line is, uh, I, I found this statement really beautiful. The busier we are, the more important we seem to ourselves and we imagine to others. This is how li we live our lives today. And uh, I think, you know, I, more and more I think about all of this is I find that it's really kind of all up to me. It's really all up to me. It's really up to my personal values, how I see myself, how I see my work, my contributions, how I make decisions as what's important and what's not so important. And I learned that one first, first thing that we all need to learn is really the boundaries, boundaries around our time, our energy. And as somebody said, we have to actually reclaim. That's our blood flow, our time and our energy. And if there's no boundaries around our time and our energy, we are actually pinching our own blood flow and we'll notice it very soon, right? Um, so we also have this incredible fear of failure. So we extend ourselves to others, to our profession, to you know, our patients. Um, and we have to really learn how to deal with setbacks and errors that we potentially can make and when things are not working out. So these are the kind of critical skills that, that everybody needs to learn. And some little bit deeper questions is, do you care what others think about you? Do you, who cares about what other people think about you? Just raise your hands, yeah. I, at my, through my major burnout crisis, I actually stopped caring what other people think about me. That was incredible experience. And I tell you, this, nothing better ever happened to, happened to me. It's like I really don't care what people think about me anymore. And so that, I stopped draining this energy into kind of yeah. subconsciously managing how others, how you may see me, I really don't care. So that gives me enormous amount of energy to do what I actually really like to do. I did the same thing, it's, it's wonderful. Because I, prior to that, I, I cared about every, you know, what people thought and I don't care anymore. Yeah, it's really true. Just ask yourself, why am I doing this? So do you do things because you want to be respected and admired? Or, you know, do you want other people to extend appreciation to you? you want to be appreciated? Is that why you do things? Um, and does your worthiness as a person really comes from other people recognizing your worthiness or you actually recognize that, that in yourself? So it's really that basic relationship that we all have or we don't nourish enough and nurture enough, which is relationship with ourselves. I think that's really the key. And I would say learn how to say no, and I even remind my secretary to remind me. Um, and I look at if I want to do something, am I actually inspired to do that, or I'm actually doing it because I think I have to, or I'm going to please other people with that, or I actually really want to do it. So that's my first question now to myself, and my problem is that there's so many things I want to do, so I have to kind of think about that as well. Um, and it's really okay to put yourself first because what you don't have, you cannot give to other people. And I know that Brian and I talked about yesterday about his guilt, like, oh, I'm such a giver, I want to please everybody, I just give, give, and it's like, you know, when are you going to stop it? Because it's really not doing you any good, right? And so that guilt with me not being always available to others, I mean, that really has to go because when you're empty and your tank is empty, there's really nothing that you can give to others. So, and with that, I'll just, uh, this is my last quote. We should care about ourselves not because we care for other people, but because we matter. So, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Do you have any kind of words of wisdom here? Anybody has any questions? Uh, probably the only thought I've had is I'm just going to really follow your advice, and I'll probably be bothering you quite often. But, um, you know, I, I think the first step for me, I recognized it, I, and I'm forcing myself. I'm a very type A alpha. 
personality and I'm forcing myself to be patient and I'll find myself doing simple things like just cleaning the garage or cleaning the basement, just mindless tasks. And I found that to be very helpful. And again, my patients, when I'm with my patients, I'm, I'm great. It's like nothing ever happened. But it's the administrators and it's the change that they did to me. But I entertain any questions. And I'm there to help. If, if God forbid you feel like you're in a similar situation, call me. Because I reached out to Mira and thank God I did. Thank God I did. I was, I was not going in a good direction. Hi. Go ahead. Stella Lambaris. Yes, I'm here from NYU. I'm really proud to be here. And very um, touched by the honesty of your presentation and speaking personally. Um, I think, though, we have a big problem as brachytherapists. Um, we are very devoted to our patients, and we can't let them down. If I don't show up, show up to the OR, even if I have a cold, flu, who is going to do the procedure that I've done, the MRI pre-plan, I'm going in with needles. Um, I also have to coordinate um, the sterilization. I mean, the, the components of my job is just not really recognized by the administration because we don't bring in the money to the department. Um, my administrator raves about how the SBRT comb beam approval is worth a Porsche. Well, my procedure in the OR is not worth uh, a Porsche. So this is a big problem that we have financially, and I really appreciate the work that is done to try to recognize the reimbursement and everything. Um, and then I think another thought I had is that we have a big problem from the licensure. The licensure in different states in New York, and I don't know if in New York or different states in the U.S., and I don't know if it's the same in Canada, they have questions that are very intrusive about whether a a physician has ever had a psychiatric diagnosis. Now, burnout is depression. And, you know, if you write that on the piece of paper every three years that you are renewing your licensure, um, you may be fine, you may be getting treatment for it, you may be have friends, you may have activities, you're dealing with it, but actually being honest can come back to haunt you. And I think this is the really big problem that we have so that physicians don't access care because there's a stigma we are uh, very much afraid to admit that you know we're facing um, real problems and it really takes this kind of honesty that you both are had the courage to speak about in the context in a room of other physicians that might you know somebody could go home and say you know what I don't know it, he didn't look so good that day should I send him a patient and that's unacceptable um, and it, but it's real, but that's, that's the stigma, and I don't know what you think about it, but it really takes, I, I, I can't fix the problem, it, it takes ABS, it takes uh, the AMA, it takes, you know, big organizations to address that, and we need to correct the intrusive yeah. licensure, um, I, you know, uh, you. questions. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Stella. I, Thanks a lot. I would just say that, you know, this, this it, it's a difficult to, to achieve balance in our career. Like, I had an incident when I was in the OR, and I was telling my nurses, oh, I don't feel really well. And as I was talking to them, they said, well, you're actually short of breath talking to us. And I said, oh, yeah, I actually am. So they sent me to see a respirologist and do the spirometry, and I got, like, I just had a, such a bad flu that I, I, I was completely unaware. So it took a nursing staff to tell me, you know, you better go and see a doctor. So we're completely brainless, right? So, uh, but I think, you know, this is the one of the reasons why we have this presentation here, and I do this actually quite often in Canada. And uh, I, I think people need, need to become aware, they need to become aware that this is actually a huge problem, and to recognize that all of us have this problem, and then collectively to really start doing something about it. And I, I can assure you big organizations like American Medical Association is actually thinking very, very, uh, you know, uh, seriously about the whole thing. Is, I mean, yeah. So, so this is on the move. Your Congress is aware of this. Everybody's aware of this. And now the question is, how do we address that? Uh, thank you, Mara and, and Brian. I'm Jack Griffith from Gainesville, um, Georgia. Um, I, uh, I think it's, it's in, in brachytherapy where we have a unique calling and we are able to provide a service that is pretty valuable. Uh, it's still worth remembering that in we can be replaced in our profession and we can be replaced there, but you can't be replaced as your position in your family at, at your home. So to me, that's kind of a driving force of all this. And it looks like you've 
made those steps to do those things. Yeah, thank Thanks, you Jack. for that, yes. There he is, hey Bruce. So, so uh, thank you, Mira. So there's very few of us physicists here. Um, I would say, you know, burnout is a huge problem for physicists because A, we're expected to be in clinic all day solving whatever problems come up, and then B, there is, say there's a machine down, and so we're expected to stay until the machine is back up so we can treat the next day. And one thing, you know, all of you clinicians here, you have physicists working with you, working just as hard as you. I'll, I'll just say, at, at some point, you know, you should just tell them, go home. Like, you, you've been doing procedures all day, go home, you can finish stuff tomorrow. If it's a matter of doing some documentation, the EMR, that can get done tomorrow. That's but a good point. Please, please, you know, be kind to your physicists, because we are, you know, you know it's like for, for the, Prostate seed implants, you know, Dr. Showalter has 20 minutes of terror and I've got two hours of terror. It's a totally different stress level. Yeah, okay. you're right. So. I, I had some slides that I actually took out and I apologize now, I realized I made a huge mistake and this was about physicist burnout. There has been investigated. I, I had a uh, Canadian uh, Physicist Association presentation about burnout as well, so I kind of looked at that. It's the same as physician and if not worse. So thank you for pointing that out, yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your talks and for your um, honesty and, and uh, openness to tell us about your experiences. I'm Gaurav Shukla, I'm from Delaware. Um, my question is, uh, if you look back on when you were in junior faculty sort of timeline, any advice you would give to a junior faculty person that may help minimize or at least uh, may help navigate this uh, inevitability a little bit more successfully? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I, yeah. I, I want to say answer that. Yeah, too. I I do a lot of work now with uh, you know with residents and actually junior staff, and so um, for <laughs> for females that have different advice, I said, well, get some help at home. Honestly, um, get good nannies. You know, get somebody to clean your house and stuff like that. It's impossible actually to to do all of this, and in general, I think the it, it's difficult because you want to kind of. Um, make a name for yourself. You want somebody to in the department to recognize you. You you want to be seen like somebody who's really working hard and contributing. And so you tend to say yes to everything, and then you get so overloaded that you are afraid to tell anybody. And then you kind of the whole process actually that's how it starts, right? But um, I do tell them that you know they have to pick and choose what they want to do, and they really have to learn very early on how to say no. And uh, they have to have honest discussion <clears throat> with their department heads as to what is the reasonable workload. In, in, in the recent survey, 2020, they actually asked physicians in the US, like, would you be willing to take a pay cut for more time? And majority actually said yes. And the amount of money that you would want to kind of give up per year goes up to $100,000. So $100,000 less to have more time. Well. It, it is a really fine balance, and I think the other really good thing yeah. is for young people to have mentors in the department. That is extremely, extremely useful because somebody can take them actually through this labyrinth of possibilities and, you know, booby traps, so to speak, and yet um, somebody can provide also support and advice how things are maybe done more efficiently or what to take on, what to not to take on, and to have that bonding and that, um, you know, um, relationship with another more senior colleague is extremely, extremely important. So that's, that's the number one advice that I would say to people. Find somebody in the department to mentor you, somebody that you trust. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think the answer is find the balance, recognize your limitations, and, you know, remove stressors sequentially. You know, it, when you identify a stressor, deal with it. Don't just shove it under the carpet because it will come back to get you. And by then it's gonna be bigger and better. One of the things I've done is um, I have like uh, my nurse who's been with me for 30 years, she just tells me what to do. I, I just am like, Joan, just tell me what to do, where to go. And so I don't make decisions anymore other than just patient care. So yeah, you'll do it. I just, I didn't recognize it. Brian, this is great. Um, and I, Mira, you, you, you hit, uh, uh, the nail on the head, or however you say it, 
we do need to take care of our physicians and physicists first before we really take care of our patients for high quality brachytherapy. Yeah. So just it's a plug in to know that we actually, as an ABS uh, leadership, we are creating a consensus statement on what is the staffing, appropriate staffing model for brachytherapy. If we don't do it, neither Astro, neither ACR has done anything. If you look at their FTE, I'm accredited by EPIX, I'm accredited by ACR, used to, but none of them has the details you need. So the plugins that expect a survey, uh, um, professional survey to tell us, what are you doing in your clinics? Let's add those hours and create a, a task force for for our proper staffing, because as a group, maybe it will help and reduce that burnout. Yeah. Because to go to 5 p.m., really to leave and don't feel guilt, it's about the staffing ratios. I am on management. I've been 10 years managing 15 people in physics and dosimetry, and I see it. I see it now. Administrators have hired consultants, companies that come say, you know what, why do you need those physicists there? We're going to come in and say, you're going to need to be lean. I'm looks like I'm really lean. I have no fat on me anymore. What are you talking about? You're talking to the bone. So I have actually have work, worked with finance. Today I am I'm meeting next week with chief finance officers. Never had, as a physicist, has to go and justify my FTEs. But be ready. By all means, they're looking at every, under every little rock, and they're going to flip your FTE models. If you're doing HDR today, with what you think you don't have as a resource, you might not even have it tomorrow. So as a society, I encourage you to, to give us the survey data so we could at least have a good model for it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to announce the next session, but you, you two are amazing, <laughs> courageous, inspirational. It, and I, I didn't, my, my soft comment here is this is a great community, obviously, to talk about this. We all have our stories. We're storytellers. Brian's one of, and Mira are two of the most excellent. Just remember, our very mid-level, poorly educated administrators are taught to get more than 130% out of us. And we talk about what can the AMA do, what can the ABS do. I take that into my clinic and to my medical staff, do a CME, steal these slides, not really, but steal these slides, um, joke, um, um, and bring it into, your nurses are being demanded of the same thing. I really subscribe to this scarcity idea, it's something, have people around you read. I'd rather have people working at 70 or 80 percent so they can fill the rest of their time with customer service and not burn out at 130 percent. That's my two cents. Um, so let's move on to the next section here. We